Great to see everybody. We can thank the Chamber of Commerce for the beautiful weather today. So I see some faces I don't recognize, but I do. So uh, welcome to uh, City of Interest Hall, the Open Space School of Public Affairs. Uh, for those of you whom I don't know, my name is Steve Slick. It's my privilege to uh, direct the Intelligence Studies Project here at the University of Texas. And we're going to introduce our speaker and get started uh, with the program we came for. But I want to steal just a second to uh, say thanks to the people that help us every day and organize events like this. In particular, the Strauss Center for International Security and Law, the Clement Center for National Security, William Bob here uh, in the back. And in the case We're of today's program, <laughs> yeah, in, in the case of today's program, also the uh, University of Texas is a uh, division for diversity and community engagement. So uh, welcome, Andy. It's great to see you. It's fun. Um, so for those of you who are not just here to see uh, Carmen Medina, who's really going to be a thrill to hear from, you, um, let me, and more interested in intelligence matters generally, and learning more about this intelligence community and the current controversies, let me tell you about a couple of other uh, events that we have planned uh, in the next couple of weeks. We're going to have a very busy spring. We've been uh, dormant for a short while, but now we're, we're becoming active. So mark your calendars uh, next Tuesday on the 8th of March. We're going to have Rick Legit in town. Rick is a good friend of our, our project at the University of Texas, and he's the deputy director of the National Security Agency. And he'll be giving a talk at, at uh, roughly noontime. I'm not sure the details are all set down at the law school, and he'll be around campus all day. So uh, Rick's definitely somebody that you want to hear from. Uh, later in the month, on the 30th of March, we're going to host an all-day here on campus over at the AT&T Conference Center. It's, uh, the conference is entitled Intelligence in American Society, and the aim of it is to explore with uh, experts from Washington, current and former office holders, how we supervise and oversee our intelligence community uh, in modern America. Obviously a topic of considerable interest now. We have the Snowden revelation is going on all the focus and surrounding that. Keynote speaker on March 30th for those uh, for that conference will be Lisa Monaco. Uh, for those of you who know who may not know Lisa, she's the president's uh, homeland security advisor, formerly the assistant to the president for homeland security and counterterrorism, and deputy national security advisor. So it's going to be a real treat to have her down on campus, and she'll be giving the, the keynote remarks at length. And then finally, looking forward into April on the 13th here at the LBJ School. We're going to host uh, Greg Treverton, who's the chairman of the National Intelligence Council. And he's going to be talking about uh, one of their uh, really interesting projects, uh, Global Trends, Global Future, that has been underway for some years. And so we're going to have a busy spring. Now, regarding the format for today's talk, some of you may be undergraduates or, or visitors here to, uh, to the LBJ School. We're going to ask our guests to uh, speak for 20, 30, 35, 40 minutes at the most. If you do have questions, we'd like you to please identify yourself and, and be mercifully short. Uh, just make sure it has a question mark uh, at the end of it so that other people can have a chance to, to talk to Carmen. So we're very fortunate today uh, to have someone I consider a friend, certainly a former colleague, and, and without question, one of the most engaging, innovative, and uh, frequently uh, provocative uh, figures in the U.S. intelligence community. So Carmen Medina retired from the CIA uh, in 2010. She spent 32 eventful years, uh, principally as director of intelligence that CIA has now renamed just to keep us off base, the director of analysis. Um, but she also, uh, she rose to the, the level of the deputy director of the director of intelligence, so the number two in that cadre that produced our uh, intelligence analysis and evaluations of the policy makers. She also performed a number of corporate roles for CIA in her career, including being the coordinator for uh, diversity programs at the CIA, and also led the in-house think tank, the Center for the Study of Intelligence. So it's really you know, quite well respected, and so she has a strong academic and scholarly bent as well. After leaving the CIA, Carmen worked with uh, Deloitte Consulting for a few years, but does no longer. Uh, and she's also written extensively. Uh, she has several copies, and others of you have read her book 
called Rebels at Work, uh, a handbook for leading change from within. And when I was looking through it uh, last night, uh, there was one phrase in particular that the one I asked Carmen about, I thought was quite, uh, quite alluring. Um, and that was the need to, uh, to deal with the worldwide conspiracy for the preservation of mediocrity. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming. Hope everyone's well. Um, just want to get a sense of the room. How many of you are students? All right, most of you. And uh, community members? Just sort of wandered in to, to hear. Thank you. Embarrassed the faculty by having them identify themselves. <laughs> so I, uh, I like to describe myself as uh, Puerto Rican by birth and Texan by nationality, uh, <laughs> I, which is uh, authentic. I'm Puerto Rican. Uh, Spanish is my first language. Uh, my father was a sergeant in the Army. That's how, when I was 10 or 11, we ended up in Corpus, Texas. I went to Eastwood High School in El Paso, Texas, the Troopers. Started off the year as a Red Raider. Texas Tech, and I dropped out of school, ended up at UTEP, and then somehow made it to the East Coast, and uh, that's as much uh, history as you need to know, but I spent 32 years at the CIA, and if I was known for being anything at the CIA, it was I was known for being a heretic, and uh, I like the word heretic actually a lot better than the word rebels. Uh, heretic, the definition is someone who disagrees with the prevailing orthodoxy. And I found the deeper I got into my agency career, the more that I thought that we needed to rethink what the agency did and how it did it. I didn't know the term then, but business model is the, the term that people use now. Um, so what I would like, I, you know, I often talk about that history and how I came to hold those views, but I thought what would be of uh, more interest, I hope, for you all is to talk about sort of what my current heretical thoughts are about the intelligence community uh, specifically intelligence analysis, that's my frame of reference, that's that's what I did. And we'll start with baselining, right? So how is intelligence defined today? What are what are common definitions of intelligence? And it was interesting that they, they were kind of hard to find. Uh, so how many of you are familiar with Rob Johnston's book on the analytic culture of the CIA? Anyone read that? It's available uh, online for, for free. Um, and he has a couple of definitions early on. He says, one, that intelligence is secret state or group activity to understand or influence foreign or domestic entities. And then he writes that the intelligence analysis is the application of individual and collective cognitive methods to weigh data and test hypotheses within a secret social cultural context. Sergeant Kent, who is considered the father of intelligence analysis, writes, that intelligence work is, in essence, nothing more than the search for the single best answer. And a strategic intelligence is knowledge vital for national survival. No problem with that national survival. I mean, can't we aim better? You know, intel strategic intelligence is knowledge vital for national prosperity. And uh, I think we can aim higher than that. In, in this increasingly interconnected world, the you know strategic intelligence knowledge vital for global prosperity. I, that's a definition that I would like. Recorded Futures website, that's a really interesting company. I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with it. They have a definition that they took from Wikipedia, and I, I, it's a really good definition. I don't know who did it from Wikipedia. It writes that intelligence analysis is the process, I can read it more slowly since I think it's good. Intelligence analysis is the process of taking known information about situations and entities of strategic operational or tactical importance, characterizing the known and with appropriate statements of probability, the future actions in these situations and by those entities, right? It's a nice definition. Figuring out what we know and then trying to figure out or characterize what we don't know in the future. And so that's intelligence analysis. So if you think about secret methods of intelligence collection, which we won't get into here, they are ways of trying to expand what we know, right? By acquiring information that people want to keep from us in some way. Um, 
Curiously, the CIA website, nor does the DNA, DNI website, um, offer a definition of intelligence. I couldn't find one. I'd be happy to stand corrected, okay? The CIA just sort of assumes we all know what intelligence is. Uh, the Directorate of Analysis, the CIA website writes, analyzes all source intelligence and produces reports, briefings, and papers on key foreign intelligence issues. This information comes from a variety of sources, blah, 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 blah. The mission statement is interesting. CIA's information, insights, and actions consistently provide tactical and strategic advantage for the U.S. It's never really a definition of intelligence. Now, I like, the, what I do like about the CIA mission statement is that it talks about it in terms of decision advantage. So, you know, what intelligence officers are trying to do, I believe, in its essence, is help policymakers, i.e. the people that the American public elects, makes better decisions. And I, I like this idea of providing decision advantage. I like that formulation better than the canard you hear that we speak truth to power, one which I frankly don't like. One, because it has the implication now that when we speak truth to power, power stops. Not necessarily true. And then, of course, it has the huge assumption that we, we actually, somehow we have this magic box method of discovering the truth. And I don't think we do. So my point in bringing up these different definitions is to point out the changing notions of intelligence. Uh, and I think people are recognizing that it's really about decision advantage. Although, even though the way we think about what it is is changing, I will argue later or we'll talk later about how we still are operating under a superstructure that is a legacy superstructure. Uh, now, what I, think, what I think are the important characteristics of intelligence, so what frames my thinking about it, is that intelligence is not just about secrets. And increasingly in this world, it may not even be primarily about secrets, although secrets are always involved. Um, the whole point is to provide information, intelligence, and insights that are useful and actionable for policymakers. Right? That's just like the key thing. And uh, there's an article that Josh Corbell and Tony Alcott wrote for Studies in Intelligence, and I think it's available, uh, where they make the very interesting point that another characteristic of intelligence is that it's confidential i.e. that the policymaker has someone that they can go to in private and ask penetrating questions of, and with the expectation that that conversation will not be shared with the public. So that's a very interesting aspect of intelligence. Intelligence also, I think it's important to realize that it extends across all three dimensions of time. You know, sometimes people think about intelligence like it's about predicting. But intelligence is, you know, all three dimensions of time are it's about the past, it's about the present, and it's about the future. Oftentimes, the most useful intelligence service to policymakers is not about the future. And that's a good thing because generally our track record of predicting the future is kind of lousy. Uh, but rather, it's about explaining the past and the present in ways that clear some confusion for the policymaker and create a better or you know, slightly more confident basis for action, right? So that's why, you know, I always would tell the analysts who work for me that offering a good explanation uh, is, is a really, uh, uh, a broad and complete explanation is a very important function of intelligence analysis. So that's the end of part one of my talk. It actually says the end of part one. So are we okay? Everybody with me? Okay. Part two. So why do we need to think differently? And I would, uh, I'm going to break the rule, an unwritten rule, I think, but it still exists. And when you create a list, you have to have an odd number, right? You have to have three, five, or seven, all right? There's some strange rule about the symmetry. I'm going to offer four. Four reasons, which tend to overlap with each other and kind of build on each other, about why we need to think differently about intelligence today. And I'll go from... They're all important, but I'll start with the one that I think is of lesser importance and then move to one that is, I think, the greatest importance. And I alluded to the first one just a little while ago, which is that we are the intelligence community. So even though I left six years ago, and I actually did have my clearances up until last year, so uh, 
that we, the intelligence community, were still stuck in the legacy model of embedded information. So the intelligence community is bound and determined to continue, I, I would argue, the journalism model long after it will have died everywhere else. Providing once a day information or at certain intervals is just silly, I think, but we stick to it for any number of reasons. A big one, I think, being that it is easier to exercise hierarchical control when things happen at specific intervals of time. Now, the, the people in the hierarchy would say that they're, ex they're exercising quality control, and they are, but it, in any case, it's easier to do that when, it's, when the intelligence is being produced in a, on a predictable schedule. And I don't know how many of you have ever worked in the intelligence community, but the layers of review in the intelligence community legendary. And I was I was a proud like uh, top layer and every other layer actually. So what are the current trends in providing information that we're sort of uh, swimming upstream against? I would point you to a fascinating <coughs> article uh, I just read on FusionNet, Fusion.net, which is another of the alternative information sites flourishing on the interwebs. Right? They're all over. You know them better than I do. And the title of this piece said it all. That I wrote, I've seen the future of media and it's in China. <laughs> the bottom line of the article is that all the news in China is being consumed there through mobile phones. And that's not even the most important part of the revolution. It's not just through mobile phones. It's through messaging apps like uh, whatever their equivalent of WhatsApp or Snapchat is. Now, uh, it's, it's very interesting, isn't it? Now, of course, the ICE, the intelligence community, spent most of the last 10 years just hoping social media would go away. Yeah, even today, with the CIA on Twitter, it's, it's held at arm's length. And smartphones are also very problematic for the intelligence community. And we generally cannot bring them into any facility. Um, that reminds me of a story I, uh, about 15 years ago, phones started to have cameras, right? And there was an agency administrative notice issue that we could not keep in our, we could bring them in the building, but we left them in the car, that we could not bring onto the agency compound a phone with a camera in it. And I read that and I thought, they're clueless. Sorry, I'm just gonna be very straightforward because I could tell that in just a few more years, cars would have cameras on them. I could just see where the technology was going and they were going to have to tell us which cars we could drive, right? Uh, but that's kind of the, the example of the kind of tension that exists. So, um, I actually, along those lines, many years ago, I observed in a meeting that it was a good thing for the CIA that the telephone was invented before the CIA was created, because otherwise we would not be allowed phones in the building. <laughs> now, you think I'm exaggerating, but it's the exact same logic. Right? Uh, whereas most information businesses are fitfully trying to adapt to this new information dynamic, instant, quick, immediately available to the people who need it, like the major news services now that are providing information over Snapchat, right? The intelligence community, to its peril, is running at least 10 years behind. And, you know, it's not just about what devices information is delivered on. It's also about the nature of the information itself that we convey that we're falling behind on. For example, big data and computational science is changing business and journalism, but I believe the IC is still struggling to incorporate these new techniques into what is still intelligence largely based on anecdote. That's, after all, what most intelligence reports are, are anecdotes, right? Uh, so compared to other fields, you know, for example, weather forecasting, which has embraced computational and science and data, you know, they, within the week or three-day uh, time frame, are very precise. And even more impressive, I think, is when they get the forecast wrong, they'll, they can explain, unpack why they got the forecast wrong. You really can't do that in the intelligence community. One of my pet peeves with my analysts and I wonder how many of you have ever said this phrase, is something will have happened, and I actually would run across the statement in the PDD, and they would say, X happened, the PDD being the 
Presence Day week, X event happened by chance. And I was like, what do you mean by chance? What does an intelligence analyst mean when they say something happened by chance? Do you have any thoughts? Just throw them out. Yes. Well, yeah, it's a good one. I couldn't predict it, right? But I screwed I, up. No, I screwed up. That's a little, that's a little But when you say, when, when you say something happened by chance, actually what that means, I mean, you wouldn't want a weather forecast. What that means is that we do not understand the causality that led to that event occurring. But I am positive that there was a causal chain that, or in a, a, a chain of events that led to that, this other event happening. Didn't happen by chance, right? So that's a, a, a it's a kind of phrase that was still used in the intelligence community five years ago, which I think reflects the lack of sophistication on, on modern or application of modern data and computational methods. Now I'll, I'll put a caveat here, okay? That you know it's very difficult to apply statistical methods to the world of international affairs. Because we have a very, statistically speaking, we have a very small end, right? So we cannot replay the Iraq war over and over again, you know, run it 10 times, thank God, right? <laughs> Just to see which course of event would lead to the best outcome. So in, in international affairs, almost always our end is one or two or three. In domestic affairs, you know, you can at least look at you know, 15 towns with the same size population and the same uh, uh, economic makeup and do a kind of statistical model to kind of check on policy efficacy. But that is almost impossible to do in international affairs. And I think it's, it's an important <coughs> problem going forward. All right, so the next reason, so that was reason one. The next reason why we need to think differently about intelligence is, and I said they sort of build on each other, intelligence community is fighting modernity. And it will, of course, now, I've already talked, so are we okay with this? I mean, are you following me? I've already talked about it sticking to a legacy model of journalistic reporting, but there are so many other ways the IC and its policies are distancing itself, distancing themselves from modern threats. For example, <coughs> the mobile revolution, which I already mentioned, the wireless revolution are very problematic for the IC. Uh, you know, can you wear a Fitbit when you work at an intelligence agency? Um, one way, I, well, I think the answer is definitely not. <laughs> one way I like to put it is when I started working at the agency in 1978, the security requirements imposed at best a modest set of demands on my life. I didn't feel there was a significant gap between the way I led my life and the way the agency wanted me to lead my life. When I left government service in 2010, the gap was much, much bigger too far. I'm concerned that this gap is or will soon become untenable, by which I mean that very talented people, and I know some of you are those exact very talented people, who want to work for the IC in the end won't because they would rather live a thoroughly modern life. Um, so I'm on Twitter. I joined Twitter in uh, April of 2008, so I'm like in the very single digit percentile groups. I knew the agency would frown on it. That's why my Twitter handle is so weird. <laughs> Explaining to Steve, it's Renunez, and I would love you to follow me. And by the way, if you want to tweet anything I say, feel free, because I cleared my comments with the Publication Review, review Board. Uh, it's M-I-L-O-U-N-E-S-S, Renunez. But usually, if you, I think if you just search on Carmen Medina, you will you'll get my Twitter handle. Uh, and that's why I, I picked such an obscure one, because I felt it was something I, I, that was important and needed to understand how Twitter was working, social media was working. And if you're not in social media, how could you possibly understand it? Which is sort of another aspect of this war with modernity. When you're not part of modern society, there are certain things about how modern society works that you're not going to understand as well. Uh, okay, reason number three. It's increasingly difficult for us to meet the needs of policymakers in terms of timeliness and actionable intelligence. 
everyone talks about it. A lot of the critiques of the intelligence community are always about, you know, are we relevant to policymakers and are, are we providing uh, actionable information? But I, I actually want to give you a different proof point on this. I'm pretty confident you haven't heard. So I want to talk about Hillary's, Hillary Clinton's email server. <laughs> Now, not only was classified information found after the fact on her email server, but this was also the case for Colin Powell. They found classified emails in his email. He, he didn't have his own server, I don't think, but in his email stash, government email stash. And aides to Condoleezza Rice, when she was Secretary of State, they also found classified, they, they, they used unclassified emails to convey classified information. Now, I bring this up not to justify any of this. Wrong. But to ask you to reflect as to what this might be telling us about how policymakers feel about being classified information. Okay? And, you know, Hillary Clinton did not set up her email server for classified information, but her aides apparently, on several occasions, used those emails to send her what turns out to be classified information that I guess she thought. She needed to know. Now, why do you think they did that? You know, stupidity, incompetence is always the answer. <laughs> but, but, but why do you think they did that? <coughs> why would they choose to do that? Maybe it was the most timely way of getting in touch with her. Thank you very much. It was the most timely way of getting in touch with her. I would bet that, you know, in addition to stupidity, the number two reason would be that it was the most timely way of getting in touch with her. So what I think this tells us is that increasingly, policymakers find it difficult to balance the need to protect classified information with the need to get information to their decision makers in quickly accessible ways. Most intelligence professionals can tell stories about policy, actually all intelligence professionals, can tell stories about policymakers who have not, let us say, handled information exactly. So I am actually now going to read a story that appears in the new book by David Cruz called The President's Book of Secrets. It's just out. And he interviewed me, uh, and I told him several stories, which he uses in the book. And I was very happy that the book was published on 1 March, so that I can use the stories, right? So here's one story. Do you mind if I read this? OK. One afternoon, back in December 1982, <laughs> CIA officers posted overseas had to provide the book, the PDB, to PDB recipients traveling through their turf, often in a hurry, while protecting its highly classified content. The first time with, I think he was Acting Secretary of State Lawrence Eagleburger, a DEI officer, Serving in Europe recalls, I showed up in the morning at his nice hotel in the capital. The place was a mess. Activity going on and everyone disorganized. I don't mean that as a criticism. It's just like just like a hubbub of activity. Uh, his handler said, can you just leave me the PDB and come tonight to pick it up? Now, what should I have said by the book? No. No. What did I do? Uh, I made a tough decision and said, yes, I will leave it. I was not going to refuse. And I said, it's not in the book, I said, but I will be back at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and it better be here. Her choice almost backfired. When she returned that afternoon, this is a true, true story. All my stories are true. To retrieve the book from the secure room in the hotel, no one knew its whereabouts. Lost for good. I stood in the corridor, she recalls, and you could stand. It's a hotel, so I could see like three rooms from where I was standing. And I saw three rooms being torn apart as they were looking Finally, it's true. Finally, they found it. That would have been an awkward cable to send back to Langley. So as late as, you know, 25 years ago, practically, this conflict between how we're supposed to handle classified information and the need to make it useful was commonplace. So the requirements for handling classified information correctly require that the policymaker be in a skip, secure, compartmented, information, yeah, information facility or otherwise controlled environment, but these sets of rules slow down the IC's ability to convey information at the pace that is needed. As Robert 
Cardillo, who's the current director of NGA, former director of uh, integration for the DNI, and the former lead PDB briefer, has said in an interview you can find online on Trajectory Magazine, goes, I ran into lots of principals at a lot of different venues at a lot of different times. You've got to compete for their attention. That's step one. You have to find a hook. Once you get their attention, your time is very limited. It's a world full of information. They have choices, and these choices don't have to be us. We need to understand that it is a different relationship, a different equation than it has ever been before. Policymakers have choices, and they have to make decisions on tight deadlines. The world of 24-hour information means that you usually have to say something about a significant development within just a few hours of it happening. Right, Steve? And minutes. Insight and intelligence that is not quickly and conveniently available is just not relevant. That's reality, and this dynamic is only going to deepen in the coming months. Reason number four. It's an increasingly complex world that requires new approaches and probably abandoning some of our treasure trade craft techniques. So it's not just about adding the new techniques, it's about moving away from some of the old ones. In this worldwide threat testimony to Congress earlier this year, the DNI noted that unpredictable instability was now the new normal. He said that the current environment presented, quote, the most diverse array of challenges, of, of challenges and threats that he could recall in his 46 years of service. Now, if you're a careful observer of the worldwide threat testimony, you will note, realize, that they say the same thing every single year. But it gets truthier and truthier. <laughs> now, you see evidence of this complexity, by the way, in our society today, in the of uh, conspiracy theories uh, aided by the internet. And you know, we make fun of conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories are a, a technique that, that people that don't have the complete picture, kind of the lay persons, it's their coping mechanism for dealing with, with complexity. That's what conspiracy theories are. And that's why we see so many more of them in today's world. As things become more complex, uh, think, uh, events are less predictable and more difficult. So, my favorite heuristic device that I use, and I'm curious how many of you have ever heard of this, is the Kinefin framework. C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. If you have a device, you can look it up, and the image will come up, because I'm going to talk about it, but I said I'm not going to use PowerPoint just to show up on the right. So, it's the Kinefin framework. It's a two-by-two -two grid. So, if you want to look it up on a device, just you will, you'll have it in front of you. And in it, it observes that... In, in, in the world, we can be in one of five situations. Oh, by the way, how many of you know the Kinefin framework? Everybody, I mean, it's my favorite heuristic device. Everyone has to go look it up. Get free information on it on the internet. It's, it, it'll, it's not going to solve every problem for you, but you will achieve it by, by, by using it. So anyway, he observes that we can be in one of five situations. Uh, simple, complicated, complex or chaotic. There's a fifth situation, which is that we're confused. We don't know which of the four that we're in, so we're that confused. Most organizations and knowledge frameworks are designed to deal with simple and complicated situations, right? Uh, whereas the world is increasingly becoming complex and chaotic. In both of the latter situations, methods and equations don't work very well. Like best practice is like a recipe for disaster in a complex and chaotic world. Does a best practice, what's the lifespan of a best practice? Minutes in, in a complex or chaotic world. In both of the latter situations, methods and equations don't help much. Trial and error and rapid sensing and responding are your, both, are, are your best options. So, uh, I, did I mention the uh, creator of the Kinefin framework, David Snowden? Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a kind of a crazy Welsh guy. At least that's how his public persona comes across. Um, but anyway, I, I think if you under, I think it's if you understand the basic thing that you need to take away from this is that organizations want to deal with simple and at best complicated roles, and we're now we're in a much more complex situation. So now that I've described my four reasons, let me offer you two ideas about how we should proceed to do things differently. If I were the DNI in 2017, 
I would approach the new administration with the following view. We want to provide you information that is useful to you and at the speed you need it, but we must also protect our most sensitive information. So if you want, we will provide information up to the secret no foreign level, which is like a, you know, it's top, it's not top secret. I know this with um, speaking and goofiness to some of you. Uh, up to the secret no foreign level through a mobile application that will work on appropriately modified mobile devices. You may have to go download some software. That, that Apple will go for us. <laughs> <laughs> we will secure this application as best we can and require you to take a short course so that you are certified in its use. Part of what the app will do, like a one hour online course, part of the app will do is provide you some visual, this is important, Part of what the app will do is provide you some visual indicator when there is important information at a higher classification level that we think you need to access in a SCIF and urge you to do so as soon as you can. Okay, so you get a report, the latest about Iran, and it's written at this level that if it's compromised, we can live with the consequences, risk mitigation, but there's a little red blinking bulb that says, you know, you need to, you know, the whole the old Paul, Paul Hardy line. The rest of the story is in the is in the skiff and awaits your uh, arrival. Uh, that's it. That's 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 my uh, uh, proposal. I think most policymakers would jump at the possibility, and also would get them away from giving it in unclassified, in unsecure uh, <coughs> venues. And as they begin to use it, I think what will happen is they will identify new capabilities that they need to make that they need to make the application even more useful, such as, for example, the ability to share annotations of a document among a user group or to pose questions directly to analysts. But under no circumstance should it be, should we try to roll it out as a complete application from the beginning? Because what we will do is build something unnecessary that the policymakers don't want. So just very simple application, very simple rules, and then like any good app, you iterate it quickly based on consumer disputes. The adoption of this new capability will lead to what I expect to be a rather rapid transformation of work practices in the intelligence community. I don't have to, time to detail them all here. And I admit that not all of the changes will be, will be good, but I am confident that overall, the trend will lead to its goodness. Now I wanna talk in detail about a change, my second proposal, and it has to deal with the complexity of the that I think would make the biggest impact on the work of the intelligence community. It doesn't necessarily uh, flow naturally from my first suggestion. So the second major change I would make is to work to inject maximum diversity of thought in the work of the intelligence community. So if you're in a complex or chaotic world, you need lots of trial and error and lots of ideas for how to think about it. And the intelligence community still rather straight-laced in its approach. We're getting smarter uh, about how our brains work and now understand that each of us brings a unique set of mental skills and habits that complement each other. No one individual, no one individual can represent the full diversity of thought needed to tackle a complex world. No matter how much you study and no matter how smart you Recent research shows clearly the importance of diversity in creating better thinking outcomes. So I'm, I'm gonna go through a few of them right now. So Deloitte, where I used to work, and we're actually, what got me interested in this topic is three years ago I wrote a paper on diversity of thought in the future of work. Deloitte last year released results of a survey of more than 450 companies. The companies rated highest in diversity and inclusion had almost 3% more cash flow it's just money. Almost four times, were almost four times more likely to coach people for improved performance, and they were almost twice as ready for change. A recent article by Catherine Phillips, who I think is a Columbia Law School professor in Scientific American, How Diversity Makes Us Smarter. She actually did a survey of all the recent studies on diversity and, and, it, and its impact on outcomes. And she concludes, diversity encourages creativity, encourages search for novel information and perspectives, leading to better decisions and problem solving. And a 
sounds like nothing else is neat. This is important. Even simply being exposed to diversity can change the way you think because people work harder in diverse environments, both cognitively and socially. In other words, if you're in a group, this is this is why group think occurs. If you're in a group and everyone agrees with you, you have no motivation to examine more carefully your ideas. But if someone challenges you, just, just to beat that guy down, right? You're going to research more and become more thoughtful about what you know. She cited a study done at a university where they gave students murder mysteries. And you know, one team would be homogeneous and another team would be diverse. Groups with racial diversity significantly outperform, outperform groups with no racial diversity in solving the murder mysteries. It's pretty compelling. Murder mysteries, intelligence work, kind of related. <laughs> Being with similar others leads us to think, to conclude, we all hold the same information and share the same perspective. In a study, another study of 1.5 million scientific papers recently done, those written by more diverse groups received more citations and had higher impact factor than those written by people from the same ethnic group. Another study which I found fascinating, published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science last year about financial bubbles. Bubbles are affected by ethnic homogeneity in the market and can be thwarted by diversity. In homogeneous markets, traders place undue confidence in the decisions of others. Price bubbles arise not only from individual errors or financial conditions, but also from the social context of decision making. Diversity facilitates a friction that enhances deliberation and upends conformity. Finally, a major book published in 2013, Rebels in Groups, which I've read all the way through, and I have a website, rebelsatwork.com, and a couple of blog posts summarize some of the key findings if you're interested, because it's kind of heavy going. Uh, this book summarizes much major research on the impact of dissenting views and teams. It basically turns on its head the kind of conventional wisdom that social cohesion in teams is good and suggests crunchy groups are bad. My favorite finding from the book is that research clearly shows that teams that are hospitable to dissenting views have better outcomes even if the dissenters were wrong. Right? So how many times have you kind of dismissed even listening to a view because you just assumed it was wrong? But if you actually expose yourself to those views, your organization has better outcomes. This is what the research shows. So in today's world, we use visible signs as markers for diversity. Like my curly hair. It's a big marker <laughs> for diversity. Ethnic heritage, gender, etc. These are okay, you know, and, and, and they in fact do indicate diverse backgrounds and probably diverse ideas. And there are, in addition, and equally important, there are many valid social and community reasons caring deeply about this level of diversity. What we also need in organizations that are devoted to knowledge work to think more clearly about how to identify and incorporate the full range of thinking style in our teams. That's why I believe the intelligence community needs to start thinking about its work, not in terms of hiring and developing individual experts, but in terms of assembling the right cognitive network to deal with particular issues. Individual experts are, of course, an essential component of this cognitive network, but they need to work alongside individuals who bring different cognitive strengths to the table. And they need to work alongside data scientists and data mechanics and next to an installation of IBM Watson and so forth and so on, right? The work of, uh, by the way, if you're familiar with the work of Philip Ketlock about the uh, problems of expertise, I recommend that to you. And IARPA's Good Judge, Judgment Project have a lot of really during my time in the IC, we assembled teams to tackle difficult intelligence issues in haphazard ways. We didn't know, for example, what was the right mixture of cognitive skills or diversity necessary to best understand Iran or South Africa. And we still don't. It's a wonder we did as well as we did. And let me say, and this is important, I'm only going to deal with it briefly because I'm almost done, that managing diverse teams will require a whole new type of manager. Diversity tension is a real thing. Right? Managers like to manage for simplicity. I don't want any problems today, right? And you're going to have to manage.
manage to allow diversity action to flourish. So I think the time is now to evolve beyond this random method of assembling analytic data and actually develop over time some insight into how cognitively diverse networks can best answer difficult intelligence questions. It's going to be tough, and it will take years, I think, before we start to master it. We may not be able to solve it very quickly, but I'm convinced it's worth it. So that's the end of my comments, and I'm happy to take questions. Ms. Medina, yes. you've given us a very thorough and insightful overview about the inner workings of the CIA and how it might be approved in the sort of singular circumstances, you know, global circumstances, you know, just in which we yourself? find ourselves. Yeah, just identify yourself. Sorry? Identify yourself. Michael Brenner. Okay, thanks. Uh, I wonder whether we might get down to concrete <laughs> cases. The CIA's record over the past decade has been anything less, less than brilliant. But let's just focus on one of them, the evident uh, sort of failure to foresee and then to fully comprehend the magnitude of the ISIS phenomena. Now, I know Mr. Brennan, including here in Austin last year, denied that. The truth is that President uh, Obama himself, in February of 19, uh, 2014, Two months, three months after ISIS had already seized Ramadi and Fallujah in Iraq, declared it to be just a junior varsity of Al Qaeda and of no particular significance. From your perspective and experience, would this represent either one, failure on the part of the president to absorb the briefings he got, the failure of his staff to, uh, in effect, transmit those briefings? or the fact that those briefings uh, were never given by Mr. Brennan so, and that assessment right. never forwarded to the White House. I don't, I have no way of knowing the details. I've been outside of the intelligence agency since 2010. I will tell you that, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, that the intelligence community likes to defend its track record by saying that we're right 95% of the time. And I think we probably are. But I think, or as I said earlier in my comments, on the very big discontinuities that happen in this world, our track record is not 95%. So I, I think, you know, I, I can't comment on that. And all I would say is that uh, the ISIS is a very good example of the rapid nature of complex change in the world. And that's why I think, you know, we need to both communicate to policymakers in a more modern way. And really, it's more important to constitute our workforce so that we have a better chance of identifying things like ISIS way ahead of the curve. And since I'm giving away books to some of the people who ask me questions, it's my book. I just signed it. Would you like a copy of Problems at Work? Sure, I'd love to. And uh, so I have a, a series of numbers in my mind, and the first person was going to get a book. So I've got another <laughs> number, but I'm not going to tell you until it happens. Yes. Oh, Ms. Medina. Strategic intelligence is the highest level of intelligence work. It's basically the deep sociology of your opponent's uh, thought processes and beliefs. And there's an even higher level to it, which is putting yourself in your opponent's shoes and seeing what they think about you. So my question is, that's 2005. You're the uh, Russian or Chinese DDI. What are you telling your political leadership about what the United States' objectives are in its wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, both political and military objectives. So if I would have been the Russian or Chinese, well, it's interesting because I'm actually uh, working on a piece, which I, I write occasionally for the Cypher Brief, where I'm going to try to pretend to be a foreign intelligence analyst and uh, analyze the U.S. elections. <laughs> and I don't know if I can pull it off because it has to be totally nonpartisan. Right? <laughs> incredible. And I, it's just really hard. Okay? <laughs> but uh, I, what would I have said if I had been uh, in. You have to know this. What do you mean? I have to know what they said? You were DDI. You have to know what your counterparts were telling on if this I most did, crucial. Even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. So, <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, strike one there. Uh, 
I imagine that the Russians uh, saw, given their own experience in Afghanistan, were pretty, uh, what's the word, uh, skeptical about what was going on and uh, probably uh, might have predicted some of what happened in terms of not, not reaching a, an easy victory. What were they reporting as our strategic objective? I, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question, even if I knew. So, your turn. Hi, I am Sorry. Ana Ramirez. I work for the Strauss Center. Yes. And I was wondering, what could the intelligence community do to appeal to a more diverse group of people when trying to recruit people? I think there tends to be some self-selection in the types of people who want to go into the IC. How could more like different types of people be interested in working? Yeah, I, I agree that there tends to be a self-selection. I worry about the fact that uh, in terms of the cognitive diversity that the intelligence community and incorrectly, nevertheless, to appeal to people who see the world in, in black and white terms, good guys, bad guys, and very linear thinking, and regardless of ethnicity, curly or straight hair or whatever, right? So I think that um, I wrote an article about this. Actually, you can find it's a blog piece uh, that appears on I think overaction.com about why the agency has trouble with diversity. And I think that uh, we have to be aware of the subtle signals that the agency sends uh, that uh, people uh, receive. So um, we tend to have a very uh, sort of northern European norm way of looking at the world. I, don't even, I didn't even like the way I expressed it there, right? Um, that uh, you go, you know, so, well, I, I will give you an example that was in the article where I would be in, uh, in a team meeting and I would hear a fellow agency officer saying something like, well, things have never been good in India since the British left. <laughs> I wasn't. I was appalled. I was appalled first and this person was senior to me. And I was also appalled second that I didn't challenge him. And I thought about challenging him, I did. Then I thought, nah, it's not going to help, right? So I think that, uh, you know, I, I think that that's a very difficult psychological stumbling block that we have to work harder to overcome. I also think that, and I did a lot of recruiting, and uh, we have to realize that for certain populations, going to school is really hard for them uh, financially, so they're working full time to go to 20, 30 hours and also go to school full time. And so expecting them to have a 3.7 GPA is perhaps a little unrealistic. So that's an attitude that I took. Um, so we have to, you know, we have to be actively uh, engaged in communities in a sincere way. And I, I know there are other questions and I'm, now I'm just babbling, but there you have it. Thank you. Next one. I saw you. Right. So, uh, no, no, this. I saw the woman behind me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's significant because you're the fourth person I've seen. Yes, fourth question. Um, my question relates to uh, the previous question. My name is Emily Whalen, and I'm a second year doctoral student in the history department here. On the other side of this um, engagement in communities, how do you build institutional support for encouraging, um, how do you build a sense of urgency within the institution that there needs to be this? both external and internal diversity? Good question. So the agency, uh, just the CIA, when I said come to the ACO, it was me, CIA, so the forensic NSA, they can look for that. Uh, just, and it's on their website, put out a new uh, diversity and inclusion strategy. And uh, they've got some decent ideas there. So when I was the DDI, we talked about, how often, we talked about diversity once a year, in the corporate board, right, at the annual diversity meeting. <laughs> right? That's what, what we did. And, you know, lots of corporations still do that, right? So I said, nope, we're going to talk about diversity all the time. Whenever it's like the right time to talk about it, we're going to talk about it. It's, you know, it should, in, a, in an organization that cares about its talent, it should come up at almost every meeting of the corporate board. 
Uh, there were no, you know, you have performance uh, requirements that you're evaluated on. Mm -hmm. And there was no performance requirement for diversity and inclusion. And I said, nope, we're going to have, each of you are going to have a, one of your five requirements is going to be diversity and inclusion. And you're going to, at your end, end of your narrative, you're going to tell me what you did, you know, what your accomplishments were in uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, I, could, I could go on like that, but I think that the way you show commitment is that you actually stop making it and like a, it's not a, what is it, a barnacle? Attaches to ships. It's not an uh, add-on. It's the essential part of what you do. And if I'm right, that organizations that master cognitive diversity and mobilize diversity of thought to their benefit are going to win the future. Then managing diversity of thought is going to be the number one job of organizations in the future. That's my bet. And you're number four. So And now I'm lost, but I have to, in terms of the order, but you're number five, I guess. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not getting a book. This okay. is not one of the numbers I have in my head. There you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm Jake Barnett. I'm an undergraduate at the College Development Center. Um, so uh, I'm writing a thesis now on an intelligence program in Vietnam, um, and it seemed like one of the big pro uh, issues that like the CIA. How was that one? At Phoenix program. Yeah, so I thought Phoenix. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, one of, one of the issues it seems like is that the CIA didn't understand the institutional culture of Vietnamese intelligence. I'm wondering, you know, it seems that obviously the CIA uh, spent a lot of time trying to understand our enemies and trying to understand the, um, the foreign threats, but is there enough effort, do you uh, believe, in understanding the institutional cultures of like allied intelligence agencies, or do you believe that there are issues there? Well, I mean, I, I think that we have you know, significant resources, as in a counterintelligence center, devoted to so, uh, I don't know, I feel almost like Steve can answer this question better than, than I can. But, uh, you know, I, there used to be a, uh, what was that magazine? Mad? There was a magazine from the 1950s. Was it Mad? Yeah, it's still alive. Yeah, and they, they had the spy versus spy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, who's never heard of that? You should look it up. It's kind of fun. Uh, and there, there was. There was, a, there was an aspect to which, there is an aspect that I always thought, you know, the hall of mirrors kind of thing that, so we were, you know, the number one enemy of any intelligence agency was the other intelligence agency. And there was a tendency, I'm gonna say something controversial here, for intelligence agencies in all countries to confuse their interests with the nation's interests. So, you know, somehow what, what was good for the intelligence community agency was also had to be really, really an important priority for the country, and eh, it's not necessarily so. But I'm afraid I can't answer your question any better than that, so my apologies. Okay. Oh, uh, gosh. I think here, I'm sorry if I'm not, oh, just for the record, here, 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 no one cares. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm David Tomaz, I'm a fifth year PhD student in the government department. Uh -huh. um, you sound too reasonable. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's a part of the story that I'm not hearing, okay. right? So, so of course diversity is good. Of course, especially cognitive diversity, right? Where it's real differences in opinion and, and beliefs and, and philosophy. Right. Surely they recognize that. And surely they recognize that we need to be more flexible and incorporate more of the, the new technology. What's, if you could put on the hat of the people you're disagreeing with, what's the non-straw man version of their argument? What, why, why is there substantial disagreement to the point that you're a rebel here? Oh, okay. So, um, the not strong arguments. Uh, I remember back uh, just talking to a group of people who worked in front of me and I at the CIA and I said, you know, Twitter's important and, and you really all need to explore Twitter and look into it. And they said to me, quote, I can't believe that you expect PhDs to be so when I talk about the resistance to modern communication methods and you know looking seriously at social media as to how it might be changing society, uh, it's not a straw person argument. Okay? In terms of cognitive diversity, um, if you are uh, if 
you have a minority view in the intelligence community, it is really difficult to present it forcefully without affecting your career. Particularly if your manager has the opposite view. I, I speak with considerable experience on this. And if, and I'll say one more thing, if you think about, so you've all heard of national intelligence estimates. And um, national intelligence estimates are coordinated through use of the community. And each agency, DIA, CIA, NSA, gets a vote on the estimate. So the denominator is the individual agencies. So what happens if an important minority view never wins the backing of an agency? It never gets well represented at the table. That's a lousy way. Since you asked me that question, I will I will say one more thing. So um, there's a tendency, I think, and this gets to self-selection and gets to the question of appealing to minorities. There's a tendency, I felt, for people in national security to have a kind of an ideological view on what was the right way. So ideology is a set of beliefs that we use that allow us, that we uh, have, that allow us to ignore or uh, undervalue certain aspects of reality. That's what an ideology is. It's a, it's a simplifying mechanism. And I've long wanted to write a paper, an example of a project I'd like to undertake is, what does national security mean in a world without enemies? <laughs> So, so therefore, I'm saying that one of the ideologies that, that is sort of second nature to being in the intelligence community is, oh, it's a world full of enemies, snakes, dragons, bears. And, uh, and if you don't uphold that view, well, frankly, that's, I mean, I kind of always questioned that view, and I had to keep that view really quiet when I was in the intelligence community. So hopefully that, that satisfies me in some way. Who did I say was next? You. Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Matthew Milliron. Um, I'm, I'm an undergraduate senior studying history and Arabic. And um, I was just wondering um, how what you did at the CIA related to um, moving to the private sector and work, working at Deloitte. How did, that, how did that relate? Well, you know, what was interesting, first they hire you for your Rolodex, right? And, uh, so that's a little kind of queasy. But what was interesting for me is, you know, I love working with uh, people younger than I am. The younger, and so I got to work at Deloitte with people usually starting out in their careers in their 20s, or something like that. And I found just basically, and Deloitte hires wonderful people, CIA hires wonderful people. And but I found the same uh, skills lacking, or that they needed the same kind of coaching help in uh, writing and critical thinking skills. So uh, that sounds familiar, right? <laughs> writing and critical thinking. So, um, you know, making good decisions uh, is, is like works whether you're in government or in the private sector. And the other thing was uh, I tend to be a creative thinker. I'm like, a, I'd say I'm a crazy thinker. And that actually, the timing for that was right because innovation, everybody wants innovative thinkers. And so that, that, that sort of helped in the door. Okay? Seven, you get a book. All right. <laughs> All right, so who's next? I, I, we're just going to go in this order, OK? So you, sir. <clears throat> so I'm David Edwards from the Government Department. Uh, this question follows on what you just said about uh, ideology. It seems to me, uh, at least from an academic perspective, that there's a tendency to reify reality in the way. Reify? Well, to turn into things that are somehow out there independent of us. Uh -huh. And it particularly gets manifest, for example, in beliefs about the efficacy of military force. Uh -huh. and that there are lots of other things, too, where somehow, even though uh, events change, things surprise us, but we know that deep down, uh, some things never change, and that sort of thing is one of them. Right. And uh, the alternative view, or an alternative view, would be that the beliefs policymakers hold about force tends to create the efficacy or inefficacy of military force 
and if they change their fundamental uh, view of reality in that way, we might open up new possibilities for more creative policymakers. And I wonder how, what you think of that. So your question is making my head hurt. Sorry. <laughs> and I, um, so I'm going to tell you what you made, your question made me think of. And then maybe, how, maybe there's a follow-up, okay? So what, as you were asking me the question, I thought about, you know, we're supposed to help policymakers make better decisions, right? But there's also a school of thought that thinks that what we do as analysts is help Policymakers create the reality that they want. So, you know, are we, you know, are, are, are we objective providers of information? Or are we more like a script writer, a script doctor, helping the policymaker with their screenplay? You know, and and I, I, I would ask myself that question because it's kind of a deep question about what it is that we're doing. Because, you know, we're not elected. They are elected. And so who are we as intelligence officers to question the, their script, right? Now, I know that's not exactly what you were getting at, but come back at me once. Well, the, their script is based on the fundamental assumptions they make exactly. about, right. for example, the utility of various sort of yes. things military right. force. Right. And so, uh, and if they believe that to be true, and other policymakers right. in other countries tend to right. believe it too. We get reinforcement yes. that makes it appear that they're right, right. <clears throat> when in fact the main yes. reason they're right is because they believe it. And exactly. Put it in so basically, it's like any you don't actually know something until you believe it first. First, you believe, and then you justify your knowledge, right? And yes, that happens, and it's almost impossible. Persuade a policymaker that some deeply held conceptual belief they have about how the world works is wrong. Uh, it is, if you have any chance of doing that, you have to understand their cognitive perspective, which we rarely do in, in, a, meaning, in a meaningful way. And uh, so, yes, I think I understand your point. And I don't think we're very good at that. And that's the kind of another kind of diversity that's yes, really that's right. yes. important, exactly. particularly in this kind of world, right. to yes. build in the, the intelligence. Right. Okay. Next one here. Hi, uh, I'm Jason Bodu. I'm a master student here. Thank you for the question, though. It's really useful. Um, you, you mentioned um, <coughs> mobilizing and fostering. Uh, for mobilizing and managing, but some of the Yes. So I'm curious what kind of suggestions you might have in terms of organizational. Tools, um, to foster that within the agency, and then also specifically um, within our military intelligence and our, our, our service uh -huh. intel centers. So I feel like that uh, might be a, a more difficult job. Actually, I'm, I'm speaking at EIA next week, uh, so uh, let's see how they react. <laughs> they do some version of the same problem. Uh, but, um, you know, there was a study done, at, I mentioned there was a paper we wrote uh, when I was with the University of Thought and the Future of Work, and we cited a study of um, managers in Denmark, I think it was, who were filmed, and they were interacting with their teams. And they were really good managers, too. Really, really managers, right? And so the uh, uh, they filmed them, and a team member would say something like to the manager, well, you know, I think there's another way of doing this. And they filmed these managers having, like, a instinctive bodily reaction that was not unlike the reaction of humans when we see wild predators. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's how the article is, is written, right? So there's a lot, point one, there's a lot of training that has to happen to help managers, uh, you know, not think that their job is to impose their will. There's a, I, it just answers this question very quickly, and this is going to be really hard for the military because it's so non-hierarchical. Typical meeting. Manager stands in front, blah, 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 talks for 20 minutes, this is what we're going to do, blah, 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 and then goes, any comments? Are there ever any comments in that situation? Better way. Totally, I mean, I think it gets down to just basic techniques. You, you say, you know, one blah, you speak for two minutes, and then you say, first point, you go, specifically, what did I get wrong? That 
that's the question you ask yourself. What did I get wrong? What did I miss? Much more likely to give out the clue, oh, the person really wants to hear what I got wrong. And man, I've got a long list here I've been keeping for this one, right? We have time for more questions? Or? One more. One more. And uh, sorry, the man in the... Well, so I'm a skeptic on change management. You know, I spent 32 years at the agency, and I swear every time we appointed, you know, a mission innovation team or a change management team, nothing good came of it. They somehow got separate from what was seen as the mission. They weren't doing the mission anymore, and slowly but surely, their value declined. They began to concentrate mostly on sort of processes, sort of measuring the change rather kind of a meta argument rather than actually doing the change and they ended badly and since you're the last question you get a book in the book we which is by the way not rigorous in any way uh, not academic but we we did do you know talk to lots of we talked to hundreds of people that we consider the rebels at work and uh, they strongly would prefer to somehow be an effective change agent from within the mission than to be sort of sent off to be part of the change management team. They felt that that somehow divided them. So uh, it's, it's, believe me, it's a, I struggled with this my whole career. It's, it's a very difficult uh, question. That's my experience. Thanks for being such a great